Hello comrades and friends, and welcome to my first ever set review. Now, before I get started, I would like to do a little bit of housekeeping. The first one is that the historic ranked queue is retiring for a short period of time. Therefore, I will not be able to make Grixis Grind content in historic, as it will no there will no longer be any ranked queues. Secondly, is that there will be no gameplay in this video, so if you wish to just listen along, that is completely fine. I have also added a little slideshow that I'll be playing along with my voice. Right, so, to preface, I'd like to state that I am not a professional player. This is just my humble opinion on Grixis in the new set. Examining cards this way is metaphysical, rather than dialectical. What I mean by this is that the meta is in constant flux and struggle. Maybe one day, Jund's Sacrifice is the best deck. Maybe the next day, Jeskai Fires takes the crown. The meta is a connected whole of many differing decks, each competing to be the best. A single card may be very good individually, but may not be playable if there are no other cards to support a functioning deck around it. For example, Nickel Bolas, Dragon God, is a good card. It gives card advantage and removal. But what if it's in a format which is over by turn 4? Suddenly, it's not playable. So, the first card I want to look at is Kiora Bests the Sea God. So it's a 7 mana enchantment, Saga, that on the first uh, lore counter it makes an 8-8 Kraken with Hexproof. Second counter is you freeze all non-land permanents uh, target opponent controls, and then the third is you steal something. So pros of this is that an 8-8 beta is a pretty good top end, uh, especially since it has hexproof. Uh, freezing an aggro player is really nice, and Agent of Treachery is also 7 mana and currently sees play. The cons is that 7 mana is a very high mana investment, and the payoff is slow. The aggro deck can see the freeze coming a turn early, and can uh, play around it. A similar card, Phyrexian Scriptures, didn't see play in standard uh, due to its board wipe being very telegraphed. So it might not see play, but if it does see play, it'll probably be like a one-off in uh, very high top ends. Or in ramp deck. The second card is Ashiox Erasure. I'm really excited for this card. Uh, it's a really cool counter spell. It's, you know, it gets around uncounter uncounterable spells like uh, Shifting Ceratops, because you exile the spell. Uh, it has an Ixalan's Binding Clause, which is really cool. Ixalan's Binding did see play when it was in Standard. And you can also stack the triggers uh, to never return the spell. This is commonly done in Modern with Spell Dweller, which is a similar-ish card. Uh, so what you do is, they play the spell, it's on the stack, you respond by flashing in Ashiox Erasure, and in response to the exile target spell trigger, you uh, remove Ashiox Erasure from the battlefield. So you, you bounce it back to your hand, or you sacrifice it, or you exile it, and uh, yeah. So then what happens is that the Ashiox Erasure leaves the battlefield uh, thing triggers, and, there, and it returns the exiled card, in which there is none yet, 
to their hand, and then the exile target spell triggers and the spell gets exiled. So, yeah, and it just doesn't it doesn't come back, which is cool. Uh, some cons is that it's poor mana, uh, so it's pretty expensive for a counter spell. And uh, secondly, cards like Teferi and Raisin Borrower are in the format, and there's also lots of enchantment hate, and there's going to be more since it's an enchantment set. So it might not see play in Grixis, but it'll probably see play in Flash decks. Next is Thassa's Intervention. So it reminds me a lot of this card called Supreme Will. Uh, and Supreme Will was a format staple in Armenket when it was around. And it can also be an instant speed drawn from dreams, which is really good. Although to do that you'd be putting 7 into the X, uh, which would make it more expensive than the Delve card drawn from dreams was based off. Uh, some cons with it is that it doesn't start until you have 3 mana available, and then it's a 3 mana quench, or a cantrip. And that means that there's a big problem that it's not active on turn 2, like Syncopate was, and Syncopate did see play uh, to counter lots of turn 2 spells. And as the game goes on, you're going to have to be dumping more and more mana into X to counter spells or dig deeper, and uh, therefore it gets more expensive as the game goes on. Now next is uh, Erebos's Intervention. So this is a really cool removal card. Um, for On turn 2, for one mana into X, you can kill a Steamkin that doesn't have any counters on it. Which is really good, um, because answering a Steamkin with before it gets any counters on it and gaining life versus mono red is absolutely incredible. Uh, gaining life versus aggro is just is essentially how you win. And uh, then the second mode where you get to exile twice X cards from graveyards is also really good. So you could target three cards from your own graveyard and three cards from an opponent's graveyard if you pay three into X, which is incredible. Because say you're up against a Command the Dreadhorde deck, you exile the cards from both players' graveyards that are relevant. So that's really good. And exiling cards in the yard also turns off things like escape, uh, and the like, and some, but some, there are some cons with it, uh, so first off, against mid-range decks, this is too slow. Uh, so say Gruul mid-range can play a big boy, uh, Gruul Spellbreaker as a 4-4 on turn 3. To kill it, you'd have to have 5 mana available to put 4 into the X. So a 5 mana play to answer a 3 mana play is putting yourself at a pretty hefty mana disadvantage, especially in an aggro matchup. Next is Storm's Wrath, which reminds me a lot of Languish. Now, they both have their pros and cons. Languish is a really good card, and it's a pretty uh, staple black card board wipe. Um, it's often used in EDH as a budget alternative for damnation and, uh, and the like. Anyway, so Languish is good because it gets around indestructible, which Storm's Wrath does not, but they both deal with four toughness creatures. But Storm's Wrath also deals damage to Planeswalkers. So it can kill a Teferi, it could kill you know, Tamiyo, Narset, blah 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 blah. Uh, it kills a lot of the problem creatures in the format as well, like Bonecrusher Giant, uh, Shifting Ceratops, cards like that. But there are some cons with it, 
is that against a crisis that is uh, five that has five counters on it, Ritual of Soot kills it, but Storm's Wrath does not. And like Ritual of Soot, Storm's Wrath doesn't deal with Kenrith or any of the elemental knights, and just like Ritual of Soot, it doesn't hurt the kitty cat reanimator decks uh, at all. As well as it also hurts your planeswalkers. So that'll hurt Bolus. Uh, so Bolus will have to, like, plus one, and uh, before you uh, use Storm's Wrath. One of the other good things about the card, though, is that unlike Ritual of Soot, you don't necessarily have to take it out against uh, control decks. Because, say, uh, Azorius Control, they focus on Castle Ardenvale, and and then they have uh, Planeswalkers like Narset and Teferi. Well, Storm's Wrath kills all of the 1-1 one -one citizens, as well as Narset and Teferi if they've both been, uh, if they've both used, used their minus abilities. So unlike Ritual of Soot, you don't necessarily have to board this out versus them, which is really good because it means that your sideboard can have even more um, usable cards in it. So the next is Elspeth's Nightmare, and this reminds me a lot of The Eldest Reborn. So The Eldest Reborn, for 5 mana, made your opponents sacrifice a creature or planeswalker, discard a card, and then you get to return a creature or planeswalker from any graveyard to the battlefield under your control. While Elspeth's Nightmare is destroy a little weenie, uh, and then you duress them, and then you exile their graveyard. So it's sort of like a mini Elders Reborn with a different payoff. And it's decently uh, reliable against multiple types of decks, because, say, a control deck, you could kill a small creature like the Reason 1 if it's being played, and then duress them. The ramp deck, you could kill a uh, Gilded Goose and then discard a Nissa. Against an aggro deck, you could kill a Stormfist Crusader and then make them discard an Ember Cleave. And then with all of the new escape cards, Exiling their graveyard is really important. Some cons of it though is it's a free mana play to kill most likely a one or two mana creature. So that puts you at a bit of a mana disadvantage when you play it. Certain aggro decks may not have any cards to discard at all. And some control decks may not have any creatures to destroy. And by the time the third tick comes around, which will be at minimum turn six for us, then they will, would probably have already played whatever card in their graveyard that they wanted to play. The next card is Agonizing Remorse, which is a really good card, because it's any non-land card, it's not a uh, non-creature like Duress, uh, it is not creature artifact like the other one, whatever it's called, and uh, it's hard, it, you get to choose which card, unlike other cards like Vicious Rumors. Uh, and you can also choose a card from their yard, and you get to exile it. So, it goes around uh, discard protection, like Nullhide Ferox, and also Tamio. So Tamio stops you from uh, discarding them, well too bad, exile. Uh, you can exile the relevant escape cards that'll be in the middle. Um, 
and hurt other reanimator strategies. Uh, so there are some cons of it though, like uh, you do lose one life when you cast it, and uh, one life doesn't necessarily seem like much, but in a format where you also have Murderous Rider and uh, Shock Lands, you will probably be losing life faster than you realize. And the other one is that it contends with Thought Erasure's spot. Now, you could go right off the deep end and be an absolute fucking mad lad and run two full play sets of Agonizing Remorse and Thought Erasure and play some really fun Grixis discard shenanigans. But otherwise, you might have to make a big decision whether you want. Uh, well, how many Thought Erasures and how many Agonizing Remorses you want. So next is a bit of a budget card. Maya's Grasp. So, it's like a bit strong- uh, it's like a 2 mana, slightly stronger Deadweight. It de deals with more creatures that Deadweight can't deal with. Uh, so it can deal with, say, a Gruel Spellbreaker if they chose to haste. It also adds to the devotion if the creature stays alive, and it's a common, so it's not bad for budget removal. Now, there are some cons with it, is that it's sorcery speed, and that it doesn't outright destroy the creature. But there is a pro with it not outrightly destroying a creature, for if there is a creature that has indestructible and three toughness, then or, or less toughness, then Mime's Grasp does answer it while a straight-up destroy spell would not. Now the next card is Eat to Extinction. Uh, so this is the new Vraska's Contempt, I think. So, like Vraska's Contempt, you get to exile a creature or planeswalker. Unlike Vraska's Contempt, uh, you get to do a surveil like. It's Surveil, but isn't called Surveil. Any cards that you have that may care about Surveilling uh, will not get triggered from Heat to Extinction. Also, unlike Ruska's Contempt, it doesn't gain you two life, which is one of the main reasons why Ruska's Contempt was so popular. Because in a format where there was lots of ag aggro, gaining two life was really important. So, Eat to Extinction is better against Control, where you don't care about your life as much, but worse against Aggro, where you do care about your life as much. It will probably replace uh, some, at least some copies of Removal, like Murderous Rider, simply because it's Exile, it's, so it gets around Indestructible, and the Surveil-like uh, mechanic it has on it is also really important to ensure you have a good and smooth top deck. Next is Farika's Libation, or Libation, however you say that word. I'm stupid, so I don't know. Uh, so it's a 3 mana edict, um, but it can also target your opponents to make them sacrifice an enchantment. Which is really good. Sacrifice gets around hexproof creatures, which is pretty nice. Um, and it's one of our only ways to actually remove enchantments. Uh, some cons with it is that it is 3 mana, and the problem with sacrifice is that you don't get to choose which creature or enchantment that they sacrifice, so if they have like a 10 and 1 crisis and a 1 1 citizen then they're going to sacrifice the citizen. And if they have a really good enchantment like Doom Foretold, and then another one like uh, Treacherous Blessings, they're going to sacrifice the, the Blessings. Now the next one is for Grixis Reanimator, which is not a deck that I've ever shown on my YouTube channel, but it I think it's worth pointing out. So Croxa 
is a 2 mana 6-6 six, six that has an ETB that makes you sacrifice it if it didn't escape. Uh, but it has a really cool uh, interaction with Lazav. So if you play Lazav on turn 2 and surveil Croxa into the bin, then on turn 3 you can activate Lazav 2 mana and get a 6-6 six, six beta that has, whenever it attacks, each opponent discards a card and then lose 3 life if they discarded a land. Which is really, really good. Uh, some cons about Croxa though is that for 2 mana, it's an unchosen discard. You don't get to choose what they're discarding. Um, and the escape cost is double red, double black, and five other cards. So it's really hard to escape. And then cards like Tamiyo and Hushbringer uh, stop the enter the battlefield. Uh, and Tamiyo stops the discard. So... Yeah, that's a bit rough. And then... In a format with Brazen Borrower and Teferi, they can just bounce the creature. So then you have to replay it to sacrifice it and then escape all over again, uh, which is really, really detrimental and a huge advantage to the opponent. Next is uh, Ashiok. So the new Ashiok is really fun, I really enjoy playing her in the Elspeth vs Ashiok event. So she has some cool things that uh, she can do. She has a plus one that protects herself, uh, and regardless if the 2-3 nightmares attack or block, uh, it makes your opponents exile the top two cards of their library if they do any of those. Um, the minus three can be used like the dispersal side of discovery dis dispersal, and you can target an, an enchantment with it. So it's a way that uh, Grixis and Blue Black can deal with enchantments without actually being able to deal with them, if that makes sense. As you bounce them, then they exile a card from their hand, and if they don't have any other cards in their hand, then they have to exile the thing that you bounced, which is really good. Really, really good. And then minus seven can just straight up win the game because it's three free cards. And if your opponent has some really good cards in exile, then yeah, you can literally just win the game. Some cons is that a two three body on turn five is pretty underwhelming. Um, that being said, Liliana, which is a two two on turn six, is pretty good. The minus three is not guaranteed to exile the bounced permanent. So if they have more than zero cards in hand, then they could just exile the other card in hand. The minus seven is very dependent on what your opponent is playing. So the stronger their deck is against themselves, the better. And there's a bit of a non-go with the minus seven and fires of invention, which most Grixis decks play. Because you can only cast two spells with fires of invention, while Ashiok says you can cast up to three, so you miss out on one card there. And that one card could be pretty important. Next up is Soul Guide Lantern. Now, when Sentinel Totem was in Standard, I did run it in my sideboard against Command the Dreadhorde decks. So Soul Guide Lantern is very useful in the same sort of way, that uh, it has an ETB to exile a card, you can tap sack it to exile each opponent's graveyard, and you can pay one, tap and sack it to draw a card. So it's very modal. Uh, against, say, a kitty cat deck, you can, if they have a kitty cat in their graveyard, you can play the lantern, it enters the battlefield, and they and you target a kitty cat, they return it, 
and in response to them sacrificing the food to return it, you then tap the Soul Guide Lantern to exile each card in their graveyard. And if they don't have another food to bring back the kitty cat, that cat's gone. In late game, if you don't need it, like if you top deck it and you don't need it, you can pay 2 mana to cantrip, so it's not terrible, it's like a cycle. Some cons is that it's only good as a sideboard card, and it contends with Leyline of the Void, which can be a bit of a problem, because uh, sometimes you prefer Leyline of the Void. I think you'll prefer Soul Guide Lantern in the upcoming set, just because people will be running more enchantment removal rather than artifact removal. So next is uh, the Scrylands. So we get Demir and Rakdos Scry Scrylands. Uh, so there are some pros, being that it's Scry on a land, and it's a jewel land. Jeskai Fires already runs a 3-3 three, three split between the Boros Scryland and the Izzet Scryland. So uh, Grixis Fires might end up doing the same sort of thing. It has a great amount of synergy with Fires of Invention. There are some cons of it, is that it's a tap land, uh, therefore it's a slow land. And it doesn't count as any land type for castle lands, which uh, Fires of, of Invention decks generally run like Castle Mantras and Castle Lockthwain. So you might uh, have to change a little bit with your numbers. Speaking of land, Field of Ruin got reprinted, and there are some good things about it, being that you can remove non-basic lands. Uh, it was seeing play, it, it saw play during Azkanta meta, because it could kill an Azkanta. Now, uh, the new Azkanta, which is Castle Bantress, is not as powerful as Azkanta. And generally speaking, lands are not as powerful as Search for Azkanta and the like. So Field of Ruin may not see play, uh, but it's good to have it in the meta because it means that if ever there is a deck that plays all these like broken ass lands, at least there'll be removal for it. The next thing I wanted to talk about were some of the archetypes of uh, Grixis. So the first one is Aggro. Uh, so that I have it split into two with Fires of Invention Aggro, which I usually call the Jeskai styled deck, and Grixis Flash. So the Jeskai styled deck will probably enjoy some of the new cards like Nightmare Shepherd. And Nadia Kraken, maybe for both of those. Um, it might enjoy Ashiok as a top end, um, but yeah, it should be alright. Um, and yeah, yeah, it should be alright. Grixis Flash will find the new Ashiok Serasia uh, quite useful, and Thrix, the Sudden Swarm, uh, the Sudden Storm will slot very happily into their top end. Uh, in terms of control, I have Permission Control, which will enjoy the new Removal, Discard, and the new Ashiok's Erasure. And the new fi and, and Fires of Invention Control can look forward to the new Ashiok, as well as the new Removal and Discard spells. So, very similar there. And finally, Reanimator is not something I play, but lots of the new escape cards work really well with a Reanimator strategy, as they'll have a fill DR regardless. But they'll likely need to pack in more ways to protect their graveyard, uh, as there's going to be more graveyard hate. And finally, again, I'll preface that I'm not an oracle or anything, but I want to talk about. Uh, the future meta. So I think that Simic 
especially between Simic and Is It Flash, get a lot of good new toys. Uh, especially Simic with Mystic Repeal, which for one mana can put a Theros God on the top, on the bottom of their owner's library, or Fires of Invention, or Doom Foretold, or anything. It's just so good. Really, really good. Esper Stacks gets some cool new cards with uh, Treacherous Blessing and Idyllic Tutor, both of which uh, will really help them out. Idyllic Tutor pretty much just top decks whatever they want, and Treacherous Blessing is three draws, and then you could target it with the Teferi Bounce and sacrifice it, or you could just sacrifice it to Doom Foretold and not really have to bother. And possibly the one that I'm most excited about is Mono Black. So there's heaps of new black cards. Uh, there's the return of Gary. Um, there's a Mono Black specific kill spell, which is 4 mana but goes down to 2 mana if you have a devotion of 2 to black. Uh, there's the new Nightmare Shepherd, Timoret, and Agonizing Remorse for uh, discard. There's some really good synergy between having, say, if you have Ayara, Nightmare Shepherd, and then you play Gary, Gary comes in and drains for 7, and then you tap Ayara to sack Gary, exile him with Nightmare Shepherd to bring him back, and you drain them all over again, and that will honestly lead to, well that's with a huge potential for an OTK. So. Uh, I might build a mono black deck for myself because I really like mono black, it's my favorite mono color. And uh, yeah, that was my set re review for Theros Beyond Death, and I hope you enjoyed it. Anyway, I thank you very much for watching. Good luck in your Theros Beyond Death games, and I hope you have a really nice day.